Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to start by talking about functions as a service, or FAS for short. And in particular, I want to talk about why I think that FAS is not the end game uh, and how we can improve upon it. So let's dive straight into it. So functions as a service, or FAS, uh, the core building block in FAS is this idea of a stateless function. Practically speaking, you can think of them as stateless request handlers, right? So if you're familiar with, say, writing HTTP controllers or HTTP request handlers, it's really much the same concept, except that they've been extended a bit here so that your request handlers can handle not just HTTP requests, but also things like, for example, when a message gets enqueued uh, onto a queue or some update happens in a database somewhere uh, or some uh, blob storage thing like that, uh, and anyway, you can string together these different triggers, input bindings and output bindings, to form applications out of individual functions. Um, and one of the benefits here is that you, when you write these applications, you're given this fully managed platform. So as a developer, you never have to think about individual servers at all. You never have to think about scaling up and down or managing servers. You just code to this abstraction that's very high level uh, of individual functions. And because it's fully managed, you can get a lot of good benefits out of that. So for example, the managed platform can scale your application all the way down to zero instances, which means that you don't get charged at all when your function is not running, right? which is one of the very attractive things about it. Um, and you also get charged exactly for how much resources you use. So for example, if you scale up to 1,000 instances, you get charged that amount. right? So it's very granular. And this is why they call it serverless. In general, it's just a great developer experience. And so there's no, no uh, wonder why it's become so successful. But it's not all positive. Um, there are some downsides to the FAST model too. Most of the downsides that I see and that I want to talk about today really stem from the fact that functions are stateless. But the applications that we build using these functions all inevitably end up managing data. Um, and data is really just the, the more common word for for state, right? So stateless data. So a fair question might be, well, what does it mean for functions to be stateless? OK, so I'll, I'll try to describe that to you. So here's a representation of a typical kind of FAST app. The boxes in the middle are instances of your functions. Uh, there are different users on the left-hand side interacting with your application. And on the right-hand side, are the database servers. And so all of your state in your application is, is shared between those database servers somewhere. Um, now, when a user sends a request to your application, that request usually comes in the context of some particular entity in the system. So that might be something like a customer, for example, or an order, or a product. Um, and what happens is that request will arrive at the service. The service will spin up a function, if required, and then that function will follow this typical pattern. It'll go and read some data from the database, process it, and send the result back up to the user. The thing that makes this stateless is that once we've finished processing that request, we essentially just forget about it altogether. We, we forget that we've ever seen that entity before. Uh, so when the next request arrives, we follow the exact same pattern. We read some data for the entity, we perform our operation, uh, and we return it back to the user. And because it's stateless, it doesn't matter which one of these instances our request arrives on. It's always the same exact pattern. But loading the data from the database every single time, it's slow. And it, it puts undue load on the database. And when you're paying for the database based upon how, much, uh, how many request units you use, it, the cost can end up adding up quickly, right? So it's slow, there's a high read load, and that contributes to a high cost. And we also have this problem of write contention. So when two users want to interact with the same entity at the same time, only one of these writes should be allowed to succeed at once. Otherwise, you might end up losing data or having data corruption somewhere. And one typical way of trying to solve that is using a technique known as optimistic concurrency control. And so the idea here is that the function will load some state from the database, and it'll modify it in memory. And then when it writes it back, 
the database checks to make sure that the data hasn't been overridden already by something else, right? So it pre prevents your writes from getting clobbered. So what happens then is if someone loses the race, then they either retry, reload the data, modify it, write it back, and hope they win this time, um, or they fail all the way back up to the user. Either way, it's, it's slower, it's extra database load, um, and it's just not a very good experience. It's also extra costly. An alternative approach is to use transactions. So you can execute the, the function in the context of a transaction if your database supports it, where you'll connect to the database, uh, start a transaction, read something, modify it, write something back in an interactive transaction, uh, and then return up to the user. Now, that's even slower. It has a lot of load uh, on the database and really slows things down. So what can we do about this? Um, write contention is a pretty difficult problem to solve in this model, but we might try to tackle this, at, at least the slow read access and the high database load by trying to add in a cache, something like Redis or Memcached. And so it's common to do this sort of thing where you'll add in some cache servers, and now once you read stuff into memory, um, if it wasn't in the cache previously, then now you can write it into the cache. So the next time that a request comes along, you can just read it straight out of the cache, right? So you don't have to hit the database. You can alleviate a lot of read load from the database by doing this. And this seems like a big win at first because we've greatly reduced the latency for a typical read request, which usually is most of our requests. Um, and we've also reduced the load on the database, so we're potentially saving some money there. But that's for only for the read-only case. What about when writes are involved? Well, writes still have to update the database, but now they also have to update the case, right? So you've got this pattern of dual read, so you read from the case. If it's not there, read from the database. Dual write, so when you update data, you have to write it first to the database and then potentially write it to the case. Um, and so it doesn't solve this write contention problem, um, and now it's made our code even more complex and potentially even slower. And there's a common saying in computer science that there are two hard problems, right? Naming things and cache invalidation. And now that we've introduced a cache, we've got this problem of cache invalidation. We have to try to keep these two things in sync. Maybe you read from the database and you fail before you end up, sorry, you write to the database and you fail before you end up updating the cache, right? So that thing can become out of sync. All in all though, We've got a lot of code to handle all of this data access, and we've still got all of these kinds of failure cases, and a lot of this ends up in, in user code, essentially. And so it gets messy very quickly. And so this is the downside to that statelessness, right? FAST is a great model, but this statelessness has a few problems that come alongside it. High latency, high database load, which increases cost. It reduces scalability because let's say we're using something like Cosmos DB or we've got a fixed scalability limit. Those reads count against that. Um, and so we'd really rather free up that load for writes, right? Um, this write contention problem, caches help, but now they also complicate things. Now we have to deal with cache coherency and data consistency, slower writes. Generally speaking, it's, it's just very inefficient in terms of code and in terms of energy. And, and I'm saying that statelessness is the root of all of these problems. So what's the solution? Well, obviously, if it's not stateless, it's stateful. And so we can solve a lot of these problems by being stateful instead. And here's how it can look. Instead of having a stateless front end with a cache, you effectively put the cache and the front end together, conceptually speaking, so that when a request arrives at one of these stateful servers, um, yes, you do still need to load the data from the database once, but once you've loaded it, you don't forget about it. You can keep that state in memory. So it's very similar in this case, uh, just, to, just like the stateless plus cache approach. So when the re next request comes in, we can route that request directly to the server that has the data. So because it's stateful, if a request comes in and it arrives at the wrong front end, the stateful system will make sure that that request gets transparently routed to the, to the uh, stateful server that actually has the right state on it. So you see A's green request there goes to the second one with the green data. The blue request ends up going to the last one there. So we get these very fast in-memory in -memory reads, right? So far, so good. Um, that's very similar to what we saw before with the cache, but the real benefit comes 
once we try to start writing to the data, so when, when modifications happen. So if a request modifies some data in this stateful approach, and because there's no separate cache, uh, the application code can modify that data locally in memory and go and update the database without having to worry about consistency issues. So it greatly can simplify your life as a developer since you don't need to worry so much about different failure conditions and write conflicts anywhere near as much. And also, of course, it, it puts a lot less load on your database. Another thing is that, um, so you can see how we're dealing with write consistency problems here. Um, all of the requests get routed to the same entity. And because they're all in one place, you can very easily order multiple requests and execute them one after the other in a very coherent fashion, update the database without having to do this you know, locking and retries and all this kind of stuff. Um, additionally, because we've got this state getting updated in one spot, we can do things like, for example, right behind. Maybe we don't care enough to update our data in the database every single time we get a request. Maybe we just want to write it once a minute or uh, every now and then, for example. And so you can do all sorts of more interesting things now with your state. Okay, so. So what just happened? We, we moved from stateless functions to stateful objects. And in doing so, we went from higher latency to low latency for reads. We reduced our database load. We effectively got rid of contention on the database, write contention. And now we don't have to worry anywhere near as much about consistency issues. So it's, it's a big win. You might ask, though, you know, is this just a theoretical thing, um, or is this real? So here's a tweet from a couple of days ago. Um, where Andrea here is saying uh, they went from 20 million requests on a stateless service down to 20,000 requests a day uh, by moving to an active framework. Right? So these, this is not just theoretical benefits. This is very real 1,000x decrease in request load, right? which really allows you to scale much further and reduces your cost significantly. Um, so you might ask the question, sure, this is cheaper, but does it scale well? Right? Is it web scale, so to speak? Um, and yeah, this architecture is very highly scalable. Um, but you shouldn't just take my word for it. We should gather some evidence to try to motivate that. Um, so you probably can't read it that well. But on the left here is a paper from Pat Helland at Amazon. Um, it's a pretty famous paper. And it's a position piece where what he's saying is essentially trying to build large scale systems that require global serializability um, in a sorry, globally serializable distributed transactions, they just don't end up working out well in reality. Um, so we should drop that. But the paper is, is not interesting in this, uh, in this talk for that case. It's actually what's interesting is the way that Pat describes what seems to be his ideal system and the kinds of systems they build at Amazon, which is very similar to the approach I talked about before, where you divide your system up into entities. So you might have one entity for each customer, one entity for each order, one entity for each product, you know, thinking like Amazon.com. And then each one of these entities has a unique identifier. So you've got an entity identified by the customer ID, by the order number, by the product SKU. Each one of these entities encapsulates its own state. Right? You can't just reach across into another entity and read its state or write its state without going through uh, the entity itself by messaging it. So you communicate by messaging, and that's how you access each other's state. And additionally, one thing that's interesting is that messages get sent to the entity IDs themselves. You don't send messages, you don't address messages to a physical address. So you don't say this partition over here or this IP address. You say, I want to send a message to customer 47 or whatever it is. And I think that this application architecture that he talks about in this paper is very interesting. And, and we'll see something similar to this later. But he describes the way that you actually program a system like this. And the idea is that you have this upper layer of code that's the application code, and it's scale agnostic. So the code at the top layer doesn't know anything about how many servers you have um, or where a given entity lives or anything like that. It just programs against this scale agnostic programming model where you're addressing to entities by ID uh, and communicating via message passing. So they program against this scale agnostic programming abstraction. But then there's this lower layer. And this lower layer, unlike the upper layer, it's scale aware. It does know where given entities live. It does know how many servers there are and in what state they're in. Right? So it's, it's very interesting that 
that you have this scale unaware, scale agnostic application code, but the code is stateful. It's dealing in terms of entities with state um, and they, they encapsulate their own state. So a, a similar system to this is, is what I want to talk about today, which is Orleans. So this is where we start to get concrete. I, I show you a bunch of animated diagrams um, and try to convince you that the stateless approach has a lot of downsides you know, for all of the benefits that it has. Uh, and what I want to convey to you is that I think that the future is stateful. So I want to introduce you to Orleans. Orleans is a framework from Microsoft, and the goal was to help developers build uh, stateful cloud-based applications. And conceptually speaking, the framework is divided up into two parts. At, on the top, we have this programming model that you program against. So again, if we're thinking about Pat's paper from before, it's this scale agnostic programming model. And then underneath, there's this fault tolerant scalable runtime that handles all of the things like routing, uh, fault tolerance, scale in, scale out, um, service discovery, load balancing, and such and such. Orleans originally was developed by Microsoft Research, and for the longest time, it was kind of a grassroots project within Microsoft. Uh, it was adopted by the Xbox team. Um, if you've heard of it before, you've probably heard that it was used for the Halo backend services. Um, but a lot of other teams inside of Microsoft picked it up as well. But now more recently, the .NET team has taken ownership of Orleans. And so it's, it's aligning now with .NET milestones um, and, and in the future aligning to ship with .NET itself. So it's been adopted by many of the product groups and, uh, within Microsoft, but also outside companies. And it's been running in production for almost a decade now. I think it's about nine years. Um, so it's been battle hardened over that time. Now, the core building block in any Orleans application is this thing that we call a grain. You can think of a grain like a state, like, sorry, like a distributed object. Um, or you could also think about it like those entities that we talked about earlier. So let's look at grains a little closer. Um, academically speaking, grains implement what we call the virtual actor model. Um, and virtual in the sense of virtual memory. So if you're, if you're familiar with virtual memory in PCs, the idea is that you can address some piece of memory and the operating system will go and make sure that that memory, uh, that, that data is available for you in memory when you need it. But later it might page that, that page out to disk into a swap file, for example. And so the idea is very similar to what it is with grains because with a grain, these distributed objects, they're always available for you when you need them. No matter where in this uh, application cluster you are, Orleans will always make sure that this grain is somewhere in memory ready to receive your requests. And so these grains live forever virtually. You never go and create or destroy a grain in Orleans. You just start messaging it. Maybe it's never ever been seen before, but the Orleans runtime will go and load this thing up, make sure it's available to you um, to handle your request. Maybe it's on the local machine, maybe it's on some other machine. You know, it routes it to the, the machine which has that state and then it handles your request and it'll route the response back to you. Um, and so to make this work, these grains have a managed lifecycle. Like I said, you never create them or destroy them. But also when, when you send a message to it the first time, Orleans will go and load its state from the database for you transparently. It'll make sure it's active in memory. And then maybe later on, you know, the customer is logged off or the game session has ended or, or whatever it is that grain is no longer needed. So Orleans will effectively page it back out to storage. You know, it'll deactivate it from memory, but that's okay because the state is always available somewhere else. And we make these things single threaded by default. So because your application is gonna have many thousands or maybe millions or, or more of these things, you don't need to scale by making each one complicated with locks and um, you know, concurrent data structures and things like that. You can simplify the code and say that we're gonna execute one request from start to finish without being interrupted by default. And so it can greatly simplify things like coordinating writes to storage and such and such. So the benefits to using this kind of approach are similar to what I described earlier, where you can reduce database reads because now your hot and warm state is always somewhere in memory, um, but your cold state is still accessible when you need it and will be transparently loaded uh, for you as needed. So you don't need a separate case. You can use it for things like soft state. So a common use case for systems like Orleans is in the gaming industry 
where you want to say calculate betting odds. And so this stuff is complicated and expensive to calculate, but once it's in memory, you can use it many times over and over. And it's okay if we end up losing these things. We don't need to persist the current betting odds. They change all the time. Um, but it's a lot more efficient to serve requests straight out of memory, right? And we call this kind of thing soft state. Again, it also reduces database contention. These things are single threaded. They're responsible for their own state. No one else is writing here. They can write it themselves. They can coordinate all of that. But the most important benefit for going with this approach is simplicity. You don't have to have all this code to manage loading data from the database and dealing with write conflicts and caching, dual reads, dual writes, and all that kind of thing. You can get rid of most of that code. You don't have to have that extra infrastructure because the stateful system handles all of that stuff for you. You don't have to have as much error handling or retry logic and such and such. And so thinking about it um, in terms of that diagram we saw before, where you've got this scale agnostic programming model on top, this uh, scale agnostic API, and then this scale aware runtime down below, this thing looks kind of similar to that, right? Um, you've got your grains up the top. They're not aware of how many servers there are. Um, and then below, you've got this runtime that deals with all of the dif difficult problems of you know, trying to cluster a machine, uh, sorry, create a cluster and maintain it in a fault tolerant way. And this arrow that I haven't talked about here, a silo, well, uh, it's kind of an agriculture analogy where grains are held in silos. So think of grains like grains of wheat, and a silo is a container for a grain. So we call the servers in Orleans silos, essentially. So what's fascinating about this is that this model, that they both popped up organically. There was no communication between Pat and the team that created Orleans. They both arrived at this scalable uh, architecture on their own. And they just happen to be quite similar. So it's interesting that this architecture is suitable for services that, that go up to Microsoft and Amazon sort of scale. Right, it scales from, from single servers all the way up to pretty much uh, as large as you want. In fact, Pat calls these things almost infinitely scaling, right? Because there's no, there's no bottlenecks anywhere in designing a system like this. And so the mental model that you think about uh, when, you, when you build a system like this is that you've got your clients, your front end web servers, and they talk into this actor based middle tier, right, which is Orleans, where your grains are just always available and ready for you when you need them. And then, of course, these things do end up loading their state from storage, keeping it in memory for a while while they're active, and any writes go back to storage. So you've got this kind of three tier architecture with a middle tier. Um, Practically speaking, it's actually common to merge the front end with Orleans. So you can host uh, ASP.NET controllers, for example. It's all .NET based uh, with your Orleans based middle tier and, and optimize it even a little bit further. So that's the mental model. But of course, behind the scenes, there are servers, right? Um, so the Orleans runtime handles this complexity of things like what happens when you add a new server? How do you, how do you actually use that extra capacity, that extra memory um, and CPU they've added to the system? So the runtime is responsible for saying, OK, we've got a new machine over here. We can start putting grains on that machine, right? Add extra capacity and take advantage of that. When you shrink the cluster and scale down, those grains can be moved into the remaining servers, right? But what happens when an unexpected failure happens, right? So what Orleans does is inside this runtime, each of these servers are monitoring each other constantly. So they do this just by sending ping requests. Hey, are you healthy? Are you alive? Uh, and then the, the servers response by saying, yes, I'm good. I'm healthy and alive. But maybe they send another request and the server catches fire. Uh, so it's unable to respond, right? It's trying to put the fire out. The request will fail. And eventually, these, these other servers will say, OK, that server over there is dead. Any grains that were loaded on that server, they're gone, right? So anyone at any point can just trip over a network cable or um, you know, a cosmic ray can hit a server and, and take it out. But that's OK, because as a programmer, as a developer, you don't have to worry about that. Your grains are gone, but their state is still in storage. So Orleans now will detect that that, that server is gone. It'll load your grain up the next time you want it on one of the surviving servers, right? So it hides a lot of that complexity from you. OK, so all of that is very abstract and conceptual. What does it actually look like in code? I mentioned earlier that these grains communicate by RPC or by messaging each other. 
And so we use uh, interfaces in .NET and C Sharp to implement this and to describe how do we communicate with a grain? What's the contract? And so here's a simple grain contract, a grain interface. We can tell it's a grain interface because it implements iGrain with string key. So it's a grain that's identified by a string. And it's got two methods on it. You can send this thing a message, right, like hello. And you can get your list of messages from the grain. So I want you to notice a few things. One is all of these methods, uh, because this grain might live somewhere else, they all have to be asynchronous. In .NET, we use this task type to denote that something is asynchronous. You know, Maybe this call is going to go over the network to somewhere else. It's not going to happen immediately. The other thing is that we can send grains to other grains. So what's going on there? Well, actually, you're sending a reference to a grain to another grain. So I say, I'm sending you a message, and here's my ID, or here's how you can contact me back. Right? And so you can compose these things together. Easy enough. How do you implement it? You can implement a grain class just by inheriting from this base type. It has a few helper methods. Implement your interface. Um, and that's pretty much all the ceremony there is. In this case, because we want to store our state in a database, we have this persistent state field. So we say, I want to have a list of messages. You can inject these, this state in via the constructor, um, because Orleans uses dependency injection to construct your grains. And you never have to actually deal directly with the database. If you notice inside this get messages uh, method implementation here, we just synchronously return straight from memory the messages that are waiting for this user. Uh, we don't have to go and load. We never say load state async. All in all, we'll make sure that happens before any of our methods are ever called. And the next thing to notice is that in the send message implementation, we don't have any locks, right? Because these things are single threaded, we don't need to protect the data structures. Um, so how do you actually use them? How do you call these things? The way you do it is you get a reference to the grain. And so we have this client that has a method, get a grain. I want a grain with this interface with that ID. So I can get the user grain with the ID Ruben, the user grain with the ID JOTB, and then I can call it just by doing an asynchronous call. I can pass in one reference, some, some arguments. I can get results back from grain calls. So it's quite simple. But the key thing to notice here is that you never actually say, go and create this grain somewhere. It just happens automatically for you by the runtime. And again, that's because of this managed life cycle. So Orleans will automatically make sure that this thing is loaded and ready for you. In addition to this, to make things easy for the developer, when you, when you have errors, because errors can happen, maybe something throws a, a database is unavailable or something like that, you can handle errors in the context that, that they happen in. So even if your request jumps across a bunch of servers because it's this deeply nested call chain of calling this thing and calling that thing, Orleans will propagate the errors all the way back up to the caller so you can uh, handle them exactly you know, where you have the right context. Do I retry? Do I fail? Do I back off? All that kind of stuff. So we have this distributed, sorry, distributed asynchronous try-catch. This is the second last piece of code I want to show you. This is an entire application that just implements a simple hit counter for a website. So this is using this new ASP.NET uh, minimal APIs feature that they released recently. And we're saying that we want to, anytime we receive a request, we're going to find the, the hit counter that's responsible for that path. We're going to call increment count on that thing and get the current hits, and then just say, hey, welcome, your visitor number, blah. Um, so it's pretty trivial and mundane, but I just want to show you that there's really nothing much to one of these applications. There's no uh, extra stuff that we need to do. A simple ac application can just fit on a page. So you can use this for things like if you want to have rate limiting or something like that. You can have a grain for each user by IP. Um, you can use that for access control and things like that and just blend it into your, your regular web-based applications. But when you want to go to production, you know, when you're doing local development, you just want to be able to hit F5 or, or type you know, build and run locally without having to set up any infrastructure. When you go to production, of course, you need something more robust. You want to be able to scale out. Usually, in a lot of distributed systems, in order to do that, you might be aware you have to set up something like ZooKeeper and maintain a ZooKeeper cluster, or you have to have some extra infrastructure. We've, we've tried to make that as easy as possible. So you just need one connection string. You say. I want to use, say, in this case, Redis clustering. I want to use Redis 
as a place where all these servers go and meet each other. Um, and so then they'll use this as like a rendezvous server. Um, and, and then they'll, they'll share information about the cluster through that. So as a developer, it's pretty easy to set up scale out. I mentioned that there's a lot of teams around Microsoft that are using Orleans. You can see a bunch of them here. Um, there are more than this. Azure PlayFab, for example, uses Orleans for managing large, no, large numbers of servers. So there's something called multiplayer server hosting in there where Orleans runs as a control plane and makes sure that anytime you want to play a game of Doom, for example, that there's a server in your region that's running the right map for you, ready for you to play. And so they manage these pools of servers using a control plane, or they do player-to-player um, -player transactions um, between two players in the game, right? So you can trade items with each other without all of those uh, complexities of trying to make sure that no one can exploit the system and duplicate items and, and things like that. Um, anyway, you can see a lot of other, other cases there, Azure Machine Learning, um, Microsoft Mesh, which is this augmented reality service that's pretty recently released. Um, of course, Gears of War and Halo are the very well-known cases, but also other places within Xbox are using Orleans too. So it's pretty popular around the company. There are some other things I didn't really touch on much here, but there's a whole lot of different features in Orleans that can be really useful for when you want to build applications. I briefly mentioned that we have this asset transaction. So you can write regular looking code and mark it up with saying this is transactional. And Orleans will make sure that it, it keeps things isolated. Uh, it makes sure that these uh, updates to multiple different grains are durable and has full transaction semantics. So it, it can be in interesting to use that for writing otherwise pretty complicated kinds of things pretty simply. Um, virtual streams takes streams, so decoupling producers and consumers, and provides it, it gives it the same kind of treatment as grain. So it says streams are always there for you when you need them. You never have to create them or destroy them, and it can decouple these things nicely. With reminders, oftentimes you might want to say, at some point in future, I want to schedule a task to, let's say, delete some user, user state. Maybe it's for GDPR, or maybe I want to reward um, a, a, a user in a game, a player, with some item after some period of time. So you've got these ephemeral, ephemeral and persistent reminders for that. All sorts of things. Um, it's not just restricted to Microsoft's services like Windows and Azure. You can deploy it, and a lot of people do, on AWS and, of course, on Linux, or Kubernetes. It supports all of these different app platforms. Um, and recently, I, I mentioned earlier that Orleans, for the longest time, was kind of this grassroots project within Microsoft that sort of just had natural adoption within different teams. But recently, it's been pulled into the .NET organization. And so as part of that, we're starting to uh, develop official docs on docs.microsoft.com and more tutorials and samples to try to make it easier for developers to use this. Uh, and so you're going to see a lot more samples and, and things coming soon as well. And finally, there's a whole lot of different samples. If you want to try and try your hand at making an application but don't really know where to start, there are samples for things like IoT or simple web apps or a chat room or this text-based Twitter clone here or simple adventure games and things to help you to get started. Last of all, Orleans is open source on GitHub. You can come and interact, open PRs and, and whatever. We have a, a nice, warm uh, community on Discord, and ak.ms slash Orleans Discord is the invite link if you want to join it. And I put a little testimonial down here uh, from someone in the community just to talk about how warm and welcoming the community is. And we have a Twitter at, MSF at MSFT Orleans, and my Twitter is at Ruben Bond. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bond. Is there any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk, uh, Ruben. I wonder how Orleans compares to Akka. At least at glance, there That's seems to be good question. Many Maybe Roland's in the audience. He can answer. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so they, they take a, a different approach to actors. Um, I hope I'm not offensive here, but Akka is more like this traditional actor model that's similar to what Erlang has, where you 
you create an actor explicitly, um, they form into supervision trees, and essentially you manage them, I, I think, more or less yourself, right? With Orleans, you never create or destroy actors. You just say, I want to message this entity, this a grain somewhere, and then the runtime is responsible for saying, we'll pick a server to put that thing on. We'll make sure that that thing is activated for you somewhere in the cluster. It's, it's not coming from an actor mindset to begin with, but it happens to use the actor model just because it, it seemed to fit with the pattern, right? It was more geared towards how do we make stateful cloud-based applications easier for developers to make? Um, hopefully that answers it in, in a way that everyone's happy. But yeah, that's a good question. There. Thank you, yeah. Well, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I, I just want to know if I understand everything. I, I, as I understood, the way of scaling here in Orleans is distributing the grains between different uh, servers. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to know what happens when the the grains are uh, don't receive the same demand. So maybe you have a grain that it has a lot of demand. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to scale it up or everything? Because if I understood well, the, it is not replicated. The grain is not replicated. It's only on one server. That's right. Yeah. So, so that's that's a fairly common kind of question. You definitely have to think about architecting your system in a way that these grains don't receive too much load each. And if you've got a bottleneck where you've got, let's say, every single user is swarming into one grain, that's simply not going to scale. But generally speaking, that kind of thing is not going to scale in any system, right? At some point, you're going to have to come up with strategies for either having eventual consistency or consolidation or something like that in order to make something like that scale. You know, maybe you have to partition things or maybe you have to use a slightly less consistent model. So it's great for thinking about things where they naturally partition into, into many different fine-grained states. Like the examples from, from the entities uh, the distributed transactions paper where Pat was talking about uh, customers and orders, right? They, those sorts of things naturally scale or naturally uh, fragment very well and distribute across as many servers as you want. D does that answer it? Well, each grain will have, each grain corresponds to one customer. So you'll have, you know, if you've got a thousand customers, you've got a thousand customer grains, so to speak. And if each customer has a thousand orders, then each customer has a thousand order grains corresponding to those. Um, there's also this notion of stateless grains. So if you want to do something like, um, I don't know, maybe decode some incoming response and it's more compute based, it's not really this stateful entity, then you can have this stateless grain that's operating on running on every single uh, server, right? So you can have these more like typical services, but it doesn't really fit with that stateful model very well. All right, thank you. Any other? Yeah. Um, hi. Um, hi, just one question, because uh, what I've understood uh, Orleans is like, um, uh, it's an instance in a cluster of uh, a network cluster. Mm -hmm. So is it like an independent service? Because I've uh, what I've seen is like it's very attached to the net framework. So I don't know if maybe uh, with other languages it can be used as a service or can be deployed at cloud and used by other uh, microservice architectures. So in Orleans, Orleans runtime runs inside your application itself. So it's, it's very strongly tied today to .NET, um, and there are pros and cons to that. On the pro side, it means that you can do things like, you can, have, you can have, say, generic methods, right? These things that don't really get expressed very well across multiple languages in a, a language agnostic way. And you can use .NET types with very low ceremony. So there's benefits to that. But then on the flip side, the downside is that now you're tied to .NET, and if you wanted to have something polyglot, there's a problem. Uh, so what you could imagine doing, maybe this is something we'll look at in the future, is saying you can run a service um, that connects up to the cluster and says, hey, I have these different types of grants, and maybe I communicate using gRPC as a contract instead. 
Um, so Orleans implements its own RPC system that's much more tuned to what .NET offers, the .NET type system, which is very rich. But yeah, you could imagine degrading into something more cross-platform, cross-language like gRPC. It's a good question. Thank you. I had another question for here, maybe? No? All right. Thank you. Um, one question to the limits of, of uh, what you experienced while building is, uh, the extensions. For example, you mentioned streams and reminders uh -huh. and things like that. Most of this I could see unfold, like you implemented based on grains, but uh, did you encounter something where you needed to build something new that was not a grain? Yeah, well, I, I can't take credit for building most of this because I wasn't the original creator of Orleans. But in the case of streams, um, they're built on something that's very grain-like, but is partitioned across multiple machines. And, and they share the responsibility. We call these things pulling agents. They share the responsibility of you know, serving different physical queues, like in event hub partitions or something like that. So far, we haven't come up with something that, that grains don't work for. But you can imagine cases where you need, you know, insanely high amounts of concurrency, where it does make a lot of sense to go multi-core. Um, I suppose there are cases internally where we use multi-threading because we need more scalability than a single-threaded thing can offer. But of course, with all of those cases, you end up with the trade-off of now we have to think very hard about dealing with concurrency and all of the, the kinds of bugs that you can get with that. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think the limits are much further than most people would naturally assume, right? And the same, of course, goes for, for actors in, in any framework. Like a single thread can get you very far. And, and hopefully something like Node.js showed that you can have a single thread that people will use for the entire server, right? And, and they'll use it for everything. In this case, if you have 100 cores, you can use 100 cores because you'll have lots of grains, each one serving a smaller subset of requests. So you can make very good utilization of the hardware without having a single grain or a single object that scales up to the entire thing. A very simple one. So what's the size of the runtime? How, how low can you go from a server perspective? That's, that's a difficult one. I, I, I think that, so if you wanted to get as minimal footprint as possible, you would have to go with, say, ahead of time compilation, which is pretty new in .NET. They're working on this idea that you can you know, take a whole lot of binaries and shake out the functions and types that you don't need and compile it down to uh, ahead of time compiled code. Or even if it's still using just-in-time compilation, um, you can get very small binaries at the end of the day. I haven't done that experiment with Orleans. We'd probably have to change a few things to try to work out how small we can go in terms of binary size. In terms of the memory footprint, uh, maybe a few tens of megabytes or maybe less than that. It scales down very well and it has very little overhead. You can imagine when you're not actively calling it, it doesn't really do much in the background, right? There are just these periodic pings to make sure that each server is still alive and healthy. Um, and and with those pings, they're not they're not very expensive, right? Because we make sure that only a subset of servers monitors the others. We always make sure there's enough overlap that, that they can monitor each other. But hopefully that answers it. Basically, it, it runs pretty minimalistic. And over the years, we've optimized it a lot. Um, previously, it used to have more background um, noise, I would say, just because it had a custom thread scheduler and, and things like that that were a bit chattier. But now it's all integrated into .NET as minimal as possible. And it's taken advantage of a lot of the performance improvements that they've had there because they've been focused very heavily on that, and so have we. OK, great. Thank you. No more questions. Oh, OK. So thank you so much, Ruben. A big applause, please. Thank you.